Well, hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore in Scottsdale, Arizona, tuning in from the glamorous media office today, um, where we do a lot of our, our uh, behind the scenes work here at the store. Um, but we're delighted to have with us two authors, uh, Lev A.C. Rosen is going to be discussing his brand new book, Lavender House. And uh, Lev has very kindly signed a batch of books for us and put this cool stamp in as well. Yeah. And uh, so if you'd like to order one, I will put a link in the comments field. And, um, and joining us also is PJ Vernon. And here's his book here, Bathhouse in paperback. Um, PJ has kindly agreed to do the program, do the interview. Um, so if you have questions for Lev or PJ, just go ahead and write them in. And uh, I will be brought back on screen in about 45 minutes or so. And I'll be happy to ask any of your questions. So Barbara, over to you. Thank you very much, Patrick. It's kind of a magic act we do where Patrick reappears as though we're in a Shakespeare play with a trapdoor or something, but such is the miracle of Zoom. So this is a wonderful book and um, Agatha Christie is having this incredible moment this year. Really just amazing. There was an article, what was it I read today about an Agatha Christie podcast where the two people agreed to read their way through the entire 60 Agatha Christie works and and then tragically, one of them died before they got to the end. So the other one is, I know, has soldiered on for six more books. But, um, but really, it's fascinating to see her classic forms of crime um, are still just as viable as they were when she wrote them. So this is, I'm going to call you Lev. Is that OK? AC sounds a little awkward. Is Lev's first historical mystery, maybe first historical fiction. Now, I have a surprise for you. This is going to come as a real shock to you. I was actually at Stanford in San Francisco just a couple of years later than your book. That's exciting. Wait, now I'm, con I'm concerned about the, the historical holding up aspects now. <laughs> no, no, you shouldn't be. This book is set in 1952, and I brought it back at the Christie because it's really sort of a classic Christie country house murder, but set north of San Francisco. But when I went to Stanford, the attitudes that are in this book about so many things were the attitudes that I encountered. By the time I left Stanford, we had progressed on to um the vietnam war and you know hate asbury and this say i've never known a place that changed so radically within a very short period of time as san francisco and you know i think um you're writing about the san francisco i knew when i went there rather than the san francisco that i emerged from but your the attitudes towards um the gay community and Generally, it was a very formal city. I remember my mother panicked because she wanted to take me to tea at the St. Francis and she didn't have any gloves with her. You know, seriously, you know, she thought, well, I can't go, you know, <laughs> I'm not dressed. And we used to get dressed in heels and all the rest of it and drive up Bay Shore to the symphony. And, you know, it was just an entirely different world. But I love the fact that you took me back to it in, in a real country house murder. So. I want to thank you. The other thing I didn't know anything about really was the soap industry. So <laughs> I will let, I'll let PJ talk about that. But if for nothing else, you should read this book because you, you will truly learn about the boutique soap industry. So I you really want to sit down with you now and just talk with you all about 50 San Francisco. So we will have to schedule that for a later time. Yeah, no, we could, we could certainly do that. Um, San Francisco and Charleston and even Boston had a lot in common in the 50s. You know, old families, old money, very conservative, mm -hmm. very formal, um, lots of art, you know, relatively fabled art institutes. I mean, I'm an opera fan, and I remember going to the, you know, War Memorial Opera House and seeing some remarkable stars. And um, there was a very close quality to it. You know, it would have been hard, I think, to be an outsider and try to break into San Francisco society, mm -hmm. which was also true. And I mean, I'm from Chicago, from Winnetka, which was a, a whole different environment. So it was a real surprise to me to arrive at age 17 in San Francisco in the 50s, see what happened. But you, you're probably not going to talk to another bookseller of my age ever. <laughs> so, so it'll give you a chance to 
tune in on this. But anyway, PJ has kindly agreed to be our guest host. So I'm going to shut up and turn this over to PJ to do whatever he wants with it. <laughs> so there you are. Well, thank you so much, Barbara. And thank you're you, reminding Barbara. me just uh, with the gloves comment, like, and Lev, you, you fulfilled this for me too. I, I like have an obsession with driving gloves and I feel like we should all just be wearing driving gloves all the time. <laughs> and you, you delivered that for me. So I really appreciate that and that reminder, Barbara. Um, so hello everyone who's joining us. Thank you all so much for hanging out. Uh, I'm PJ Vernon. I am a queer crime writer as um, Barbara already said, and it is an absolute honor and privilege um, to share tonight with an incredible uh, queer voice in um, all kinds of fiction, but tonight historical crime fiction. Uh, my friend Lev, uh, AC Rosen, as he celebrates the release of his phenomenal, um, often compared to with uh, queer knives out, but also totally standing in its own electrical power all on its own. Um, uh, Lavender House, which hits shelves tomorrow, wherever books are sold. And of course, books are sold here at the Poison Pen, which we're very grateful for and sign. Um, so cheers to you uh, for that, for sure. <laughs> and um, before we uh, dive in, I just want to start with uh, a land acknowledgement. Um, as our evening's host, I'm calling in from Calgary, um, up here in Canada, um, and I am grateful and privileged to honor the land that I live on, um, draw creativity from, uh, and beautifully experience each and every day. So it is in the spirit of respect, reciprocity, and truth that we honor and acknowledge um, this land as Mokinsis um, and the traditional Treaty 7 territory and oral practices of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Siksika, Gainai, Pikani, as well as the Stony Nakoda and Sutina nations. Um, we acknowledge that this territory is home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3 uh, within the historical Northwest Métis homeland. Finally, we acknowledge all nations, um, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, who live, work, and play on this land um, and who honor and celebrate this territory. Um, so I'd also like to thank again Poison Pin for having us, obviously love for the honor of hanging out and uh, how are you doing tonight, my friend, on the eve of your incredible, you have a lot to be proud of, how are you feeling? I'm, I'm feeling okay, I did panic eat like a half bag of popcorn earlier, but otherwise I'm feeling okay, I think, uh, you know, I'm trying to keep busy. <laughs> yeah. I worked out for a little longer than I needed to today, just anything to sort of keep the brain empty <laughs> yeah yeah are you how are you feeling in terms of i mean you again like i'm very proud of you i think people in just our in our writing community but also the country the world over have a lot to be proud of anytime there's a new voice a new take on something um and an examination of an experience that hasn't really been surfaced in the way that you you know brilliantly surfaced um what you did with lavender house um which is like so immersive and so sharp and I think I said like it, the knives in this book are like velvet or the velvet knives are so are sharp as hell and they absolutely absolutely are um are you feeling are you feeling as proud of yourself as I feel for you and I know so many <laughs> others so I hope the answer is yes but I don't know I don't know I I think that you know especially the eve of a book coming out there's it, having done it you know several times before at this point and and been you know publishing for about a decade at this point um i i've learned to temper expectations and excitement <laughs> you know at this point i'm really happy and i'm really proud of the book and i think that it's it's something that i i was really excited to write and something that you know like my writing group who i've been with since graduate school said it was the book you were meant to write it just combines so many of the things i love and things i wanted to do and takes it in like a familiar but fresh direction i hope and i think that you know i'm i'm proud but i am energy level optimism all very controlled very we'll see what it is and i am I'm gonna let it happen. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, I mean, you've done the work, right? Like you've done the work, it's out in the world now, like you've done your part and the world is very lucky to have you and your work and your voice. So um, on behalf of the world, if I may be so bold. <laughs> um, so uh, we have a couple of things in common. Obviously we both wrote 
house books, mine being about baths and yours being about soap. So we're a match mm -hmm. made in heaven already. Yes, right there. exactly. <laughs> um, but we also have like I, you told me you collect tarot cards. Mm -hmm. So we have that in common. So I'm wondering if if you were to draw a card to represent Lavender House, what would you draw and why? Oh boy. I mean, it would depend on the deck, but probably the hermit. Uh, just because it is about the idea of sort of seclusion. It's about getting away from society and uh, what that seclusion does to people, whether it's a part of like saving them or a part of oppressing them or as in this book, sort of both. And uh, what it means for someone to go from the world, uh, even if they have been sort of shutting themselves off from it, into this secluded space, into Lavender House, and how that changes him. Yeah, I love that. I love that. I can definitely see see how that definitely fits. Um, I chose for a reason because this is a spoiler free conversation tonight, obviously. Um, <laughs> but so I think hopefully you'll get this and appreciate this, but it, but probably not going to be obvious. I chose the Six of Swords, which is of course the Fairy Man, um, mm -hmm. for hopefully reasons that you get, but. Um, it, as you said yourself, like it is, it, it's a rich, it really is. There's so many threads that you had to pull together. Um, I know you are uh, really into fabrics and that shows in the pages of your book, the way you talk <laughs> about, I mean, you can feel, you can feel fat. I mean, you're, you're very visceral in your writing. You can feel the fabrics, like the stitching, like, um, just the material. It's like, you could almost touch, right? Like while you're reading, same thing with flowers. I love flowers myself. Um, and it's like you could smell flowers on every page as you sort of the way that you spoke about them and, and brought them to life. It really was a really rich, um, robust tapestry with a lot of threads. And the book comes together, the way that you bring all of those together um, is so it's so clean, it's natural, obviously, um, but it's so clean, not literally clean. It's, it's not literally clean at all. <laughs> um, but in a way that feels so natural, um, and there's just this beautiful bookending um, sort of structure mm -hmm. that struck me that I find is rare, at least in my limited reading, um, and therefore also really difficult to like pull off, and you did it, and it was, it was a wonderful experience. And so I'm wondering however you wanna take this question. Where did this book come from? <laughs> I mean, it came from a lot of different places. It's so, uh, you know, as Barbara said, there's definitely a hefty dose of Agatha Christie in this. And there's also, I think, a strong dose of Chandler. You know, I grew up on the old uh, Bogart and Bacall movies. My parents watched them with me all the time and I still watch them. I you can't see it in my very messy office, but just above me, there's a signed uh, photo of Lauren Bacall because like she's everything I want to be when I grow up. I just think, you know, I, I would watch anything with her. I did watch everything with her. Um, and so, and I read everything by Chandler and all that sort of infused me. And it's something I've always, I've wanted to do. And I had another detective novel out years ago um, called Depth and it was also post-apocalyptic. It was a noir and what I was doing there, and part of this was because I felt like at the time I couldn't write a queer protagonist. Um, so what I was doing is I wanted to write a female protagonist um, because that felt a little closer to my experience as a gay man, which I think is something a lot of gay men can relate to. And, uh, you know, being able to sort of talk about being attracted to men, be feeling like an outsider of the patriarchy. You know, I thought that the way to do that would be to take a female detective and I wanted to get back to the grid of New York. So I propelled it forward. And that's how I, I got to my sort of noir feeling. But after writing YA where queer protagonists are like, you know, popular now, I mean, not crazy popular, but certainly more common, I, I felt license to, uh, you know, try that with adults as well. And so I wanted to write a queer history historical novel in the style of the Chandler books that I love so much. I wanted to take back that that bit of history and queer it. And, uh, you know, I think that this story, you know, a cop who is caught uh, in a raid on a gay bar 
and is, is thinking about throwing his life away because it's gone and then is suddenly whisked away to solve a murder in a country estate filled with queer people. I think that that Agatha Christie setup is what let me delve into the, the, the historical aspect of it. And I remember at one point watching some Agatha Christie adaptation. I think it was Ordeal by Innocence, the Amazon Prime one. And I remember it, it very campy, like 90% staircases and Anna Chancellor is in it, <laughs> which should tell you exactly what level of camp we're hitting. Um, and I loved it, but I remember thinking to myself, this, this if everyone were queer. And so that plus my love of the old noir finally had sort of a shape to take and I just wrote it and it felt really good to write. And I'm, I'm really grateful to my editor at Forge, Kristen, who saw it and actually encouraged me to sort of let it breathe a little more than I had. Uh, I, I think I had gone for a very clipped noir tone originally where we were a lot more distant from Andy, the detective. Um, but with, with her edits, we get to know him and through him, the community that he is entering so much better. Um, so yeah, it came from a lot of places. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, oh. Hang on a minute, PJ. I'm gonna, I'm gonna intervene here for a minute because I wanna clear something up because you don't normally say Noir and Agatha Christie in the same sentence. Mm -hmm. um, when I said Agatha Christie, that's kind of a shorthand for a particular mystery structure. She was very, um, you know, she, it's easy for people to understand when you say Agatha Christie, that kind of, that, that country house, that isolated, if you mm -hmm. put everybody together in a place and it has, it doesn't have permeable barriers so that it's only the people inside whatever this structure is that are involved in the crime. I mean, you know, when you say country house murder, it could actually be a cabin on a ship or a theater or you know mm -hmm. practically anything but the point is that it has a barrier around it the victim is yeah. inside and it was so fun. inside and the detective is either brought in or sometimes finds himself there and so you can actually do agatha christie with a noir voice and you know i just i just wanted to make that clear and i think a lot of the reason that people <clears throat> excuse me often first authors come to crime is because there is such a well-known structure for the book. And, you know, it, it, it's a blueprint almost for how you're going to set up the story. Yeah, I think it was, it was Hank Philippi Ryan who said, I think in a uh, Poison Pen event, when she was talking about reading the book, she actually said it was part Christie and part Chandler and part La Caja Fa. And that is still to this day, like the best description I've ever heard of it. And so I think that uh, being able to take that Christie setup and the Chandler voice, which I hope I did, is what made it, it, it's how two things came together for me. Well, that's right. And it's really not, you know, it sounds like it might be a cop novel, but in truth, it isn't because he's been disgraced. He's been kicked out of his apartment. He's been kicked off the force. Mm -hmm. Nobody will talk to him. And so really, he's basically functioning in the same way that Hercule Poirot or a private detective, he's a private detective in this book, despite the fact that he was professionally a cop until the raid, right? Yeah, yeah. And you Another know, the, distinction. and he becomes a more distinct private investigator in the sequel. I'm really happy he didn't turn into Alan Turing. You know, I could hardly, I mean, I've, I, I have seen plays about, I mean, I was, I was really worried he was going to go that direction. And I thought, great, you've given him a crime and a found family and something to do. <laughs> so he's not going to bite the poison apple. I was quite worried. Yeah, no, I mean, I think I, 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 it's interesting, especially coming from young adults, um, where my last two books were, the idea of sort of that danger and the, I, the, the, the level of depression that I let Andy experience, especially early on. Um, and you know the the concern about that, the sort of violence that's enacted on him, both internally and externally. Um, I didn't want it to go to like I wanted it to be dark because I think in the fifties being queer was a very noir thing. You know, you talk about being trapped, uh, and you know, uh, you talk about the idea that 
it's you against the world. And that feels very real. But I also wanted to remind people, especially these days, that it's not just you if you can find other people like you. And that's sort of, I think of sort of softer noir. I think of, and obviously the Chandler books and the movies, very different. But I think of like the end of The Big Sleep where Bogart and McCall sort of grip each other and they're about to, you know, lie to the cops and send her sister away, but they have each other. Or I think of the end of Laura, one of my favorites, which is maybe more of a romance than a noir, but it ends again with the they're, they're watching this horrible thing, but they're together. They found each other. And that definitely informs my way of thinking of Dewar, I think. Okay. I mean, yeah. I, oh. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to shut up after this. Oh. I was going to say that I actually thought that the found family aspect of this book was the most profound. Thank theme, you. Whatever you want to call it. Um, but, you know, the fact that you have this disparate group and you had somebody whose life had been completely shattered um, and then they they create a family and that's very much a contemporary you may be in 1952 but that's a very contemporary thing you know creating your own family and it's certainly true in queer culture because you know sort of the, the normal family structure isn't isn't available yeah I think that found family is definitely a, a queer thing that we've been ha we've had going on for generations at this point <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's immigrant families and all kinds of things it isn't just queer families as you know look at the afghan refugees and all the rest of it you mm -hmm. have people who are trying you know are going to have to create their own families because the family structure that they might have expected has been blown away yeah yeah so i mean on that on that note um while i a similar note um while i was reading um, I kept the phrase that kept popping in my head was like a gilded cage, right? Like gilded mm -hmm. cages. Um, you spin this sort of I, this queer island, so to speak, where um, uh, all of these like very entertaining, very colorful, oftentimes very misguided, but for uh, mostly justifiable, mostly um, justifiable reasons at times, um, they come to experience themselves within um this this house and your characters allude or talk about quite frequently this concept of the safety within mm -hmm. and the danger without beyond these fortress walls of this of this mansion so talk to me a little bit about um queerness about uh maybe gilded cages uh, as a metaphor here um and then what some of what's going on what are some of the shenanigans and tragedies and things that are unfolding within this gilded cage that you've constructed in lavender house um yeah i mean i think part of it does get back to the sort of the country house murder thing and i wanted to explore what that would mean if the family within it was queer you know in the 50s and so in that case it's not just that like we're in a country house and no one else has come in, no one else can go out. But uh, it's also, if we go out, we're in danger. If we go out, we have to change who we are. And I think that that is definitely something that you know is true of a lot of people, queer or not. But I wanted to play with the sort of danger of that, but also the allure of it. You know, if you found this space within your family, like everything would feel sort of free. And it's interesting because, you know, in the 50s, there were lots of gay clubs in San Francisco. There were, there were many gay clubs. And so there was a certain amount of freedom if you were willing to go to those clubs and be open about who you were. Like you could have that. It's just that then you would be kicked out of the rest of society. You obviously wouldn't be able to hold several jobs um, uh, uh, and almost anyone would be able to fire you simply for being queer, um, uh, uh, which is still true today in many states. Um, but I think that what's so exciting to me as a writer about that in-out sort of uh, scenario is the idea that maybe what feels like freedom actually feel or what looks like freedom feels like such a a, a, a trap in the end yeah. like this illusion becomes a trap and getting to see 
how that affects each of these people who came to that supposed freedom in different ways and for different reasons. Yeah, that and that like, so kind of like dovetailing with that, um, I thought a lot about like truth while I was reading and or the inverse of that, like withholding truth. Um, I know like queer folks, if you're like me, you're like really good at keeping like at least one secret uh, <laughs> for, for a stretch of your life to survive um, and, and confront many of the things that you're talking about because in many ways our world has not changed and in some ways it's gotten much better but in other ways as we're seeing play out um, day by day, um, uh, particularly in other members of our family, uh, when we talk about trans folks and two-spirit and gender questioning youth and those sorts of things, there's, that is, it's ever more so relevant um, today. Um, but you made a great point, and I think it was your protagonist, um, Andy Vander, and I, I believe if I recall, he was talking to Pat, um, the butler, um, and Pat was giving him sort of the take on um, you know, when characters like Andy go out to these underground clubs or, or gay or above ground clubs that are being harassed by, um, you know, society and constructs in place, um, what they're actually going there to see, what they're seeing themselves um, while they're in those spaces, um, and what they are actually, not what they're telling themselves they're going to get, uh, but what they're actually getting when they go there versus what they're not getting when they go there. Mm -hmm. And then he flips it around and he says, you know, Lavender House, I'm quoting, or not, or not loosely quoting, obviously, but something along the lines of like, Lavender House is sort of like a mirror for these characters once they come in and they think consciously that they're now their authentic selves within this mm -hmm. space, but it's a mirror. And so mm -hmm. can you tell us, I, I, that was beautiful. It spoke to me on like 18 different levels. Um, but tell me a little bit about the mirror role that the house plays for your characters. Oh, that's such a fun thing to do, especially having just finished the sequel, which like has so much mirror stuff in it. But um, I think that what I wanted to do with this house in terms of like what, how it changed the characters is sort of show, it's almost like one of those twisted, you know, uh, it's like a, 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 a genie's wish, you know? <laughs> uh, I wish I could live in a house with only queer people. Congratulations, you can. Um, here are the people, but also if you leave, it becomes a different situation. And I think that, you know, the one, we'll drift a little spoilery maybe, but the one who to me uh, had to confront who she what she really wanted the most would have been Margot mm -hmm. and in the house you know there is um the to explain a little the there's a the dead matriarch Irene Lamontagne who maybe has been murdered um her wife who posed as her secretary Pearl and their son who is Irene's son from her late husband um who is also queer but because it's a soap company and he was gonna run it, they knew they had to get him married. So they found a lesbian and that lesbian is Margot. And Margot is cold as ice. Um, and uh, she is standoffish and she doesn't like Andy the detective being here. And she's also gotten really into sort of getting good at running the business, something that Irene would, have done. She's very good at that. She's she's found a place for herself here. But when she talks about who she was, which was like a girl in a motorcycle jacket going to lesbian bars, it becomes this whole like, well, I came here because they were offering me money and freedom in exchange for a marriage. And like, I can have a girlfriend, I can sort of live my life. But to sort of thrive here, I've had to become this perfect model for magazines and my dresses and like, you know, who she was is, is, is practically out the door. Even when she's walking around the house, she's in like a perfect trendy dress. She's not wearing the motorcycle jacket anymore. And, you know, I think a lot about queer history and one of the earliest gay rights organizations was the Mattachine Society, which uh, was founded uh, 1950, I think, in Los Angeles. And they actually would have had, around the time this novel is happening, they would have had this big split from the original founders um, and become 
the original founders would then go on to start one magazine back in LA and the Magazine Society would operate primarily out of San Francisco at that point. And what they did, what their, their philosophy was essentially, was that, um, and this is what they split over too, they believed that queer people um, were exactly the same as straight people except for the one thing, as opposed to the original founders who felt there was something akin to queer culture. And so what this new Mattachine that believed there was no difference would do is they would have uh, these events where women or men who were too stereotypically queer, women who wore boots and motorcycle jackets, men who uh, you know, were in colorful clothes and swayed when they walked, they would teach them to behave more heteronormatively. And there's like a story of one woman walking in heels for the first time very elegantly and everyone applauding, like it was exactly what they wanted. And so that sort of story, which I actually also tell in my young adult book camp, um, informed a lot of Margot's character, that idea of how you might shift uh, to become what the world wants you to be even as you get to preserve what you think is at the core of your being. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I'm not no, even sure at that point. It, it absolutely does. And you see it so much. Like I think, you know, even, even just the things that they bring into the home with them or, or these veneers that they put on um, using Margot specifically, if I'm not mistaken, um, the, like, how do I act this way? And I'll look to my mother or I'll look to someone else to sort of adopt this like veneer of, of a role and then take that on as if it's my own um, when it's it's just that it's plastic wrapping that you put on to, to sort of to, to get through the day um, some people more viciously and successfully uh, in your book than others but but you know alternatively in the same vein you've got other characters who you know um, again like no spoilers but this isn't a spoiler it's it's part of so many people's experiences have fled actual tra brutal trauma brutal abuse um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, these characters, they carry a lot of weight on their shoulders, all of them. Um, and, you know, some of it they bring on themselves. It's the plot of your book, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> but at the same time, and at least from my viewpoint, far and away, like most of it doesn't belong to them. You know, you've got mm -hmm. um, lots of parent stuff and um, cultural stuff, religious stuff. Um, uh, tragic intersectionality between, you know, uh, misogyny, um, classism that they, that they, you know, are, are navigating, um, homophobia, transphobia, racism, like all that stuff that is, of course, people will say is germane to that period, but is germane to now um, as well. Um, and even for a reader like me, I'm reading it and, you know, it's making me uncomfortable in this now mo moment, reading about this time, because there's a, a good kind of uncomfortable, the, the, the feelings that, you know, I need to, that we all should, or we all could choose to um, uh, surface, to feel, to process, to express. Um, and so I'm, talk to me a little bit about, um, as a queer writer, um, or, you know, just marginalized folks collectively. Um, how do we like break these cycles? So the cycles that you see playing out or, or rather the better way to frame it might be, what does Lavender House have to show us about breaking chains that don't, that perhaps don't belong to us, these sort of past stories and echoes of the past um, so that, you know, we free ourselves and that we free those around us and then free people who come, you know, sort of next, folks who comes next. What, what do you have to say about breaking chains like that? Well, I think that the idea of sort of exploring any sort of queer history unto itself is a form of breaking chains. I mean, one of the things that, you know, as queer people, we are we're mostly born to straight families, you know, uh, a, 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 as a Jew, I was raised Jewish, you know, I, I, I understood that culture, I learned it from my parents, I understood my place in the world as a Jew from my parents. As a queer person, I didn't have that. Um, and I think that's, that's true for most queer people. So the ability to tell our stories and tell our history, more specifically, um, is what will enable us to sort of go forward. You know, I look at sort of queer culture sometimes and the conversations that always come up 
on social media and it feels like the same ones over and over again and it feels like the same ones over and over again that like if you look back we've been having since the Mattachine society split um so it and i think that if we knew more about our own history more about the way that we had uh, our our ancestors our queer ancestors had navigated their queerness in different times, I think that that would break a lot of change for a lot of people. And I think, you know, these days you look at, you know, they're actively trying to prevent the teaching of queer history in schools um, to younger people. And, you know, you look at the fact that even before then, I went to, you know, a private high school in New York City. I went most liberal possible situation. And we didn't learn anything really pre-Stonewall. You know, that was the start of queer history, 1969. But no, we go back, you know, all the, we go back way far back. Maybe you learn a little about Oscar Wilde, but it, 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 there's so much history that is constantly erased and not discussed. And so the ability to sort of put it in a fun, you know, I'm not a historian. I'm not going to try to write a history novel, but uh, a historical, you know, novel, not a history book is what I mean, um, is something that can can teach us in a way that feels fun and entertaining and can help us identify our own history and our place in the world as queer people by being like, oh, we did have stories back then. Like we were a part of this. And you look at like so much erased history, you know, the Kinsey Report was a bestseller in 1950. You look at stuff like that. Um, or there's a book in Lavender House that Pat mentions, um, the, the the life of the homosexual, something like that. It was written under a pen name. And he he actually has a quote in there, which uh, he quotes the book and it's, and I'm gonna paraphrase because I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, the only problem that queer people, the only problem that the homosexual actually faces is heterosexual society. And, you know, the fact that that idea was being put out there in a book in 1951 or 52, I don't remember exactly when it came out, in a book that sold really well too. Like, and then we forget that, like it's gone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like that to me is wild. And being able to sort of show people that and being able to be like, hey, look, we've been around, we've been talking about this. We have been figuring this out. You are part of a legacy that can really help queer people, especially young queer people. Again, I write YA, <laughs> I think about yeah. young people a lot, really sort of empower themselves and, and find their own identities in a way that feels holistic as opposed to, uh, you know, dependent on what other people are saying it is to be queer. Yeah, I love that you brought up that quote because as you were answering, like that's exactly where my mind went. I, I probably, I'm like, you know, just not not at all as well read as I would like in some of these spaces. I would have, I would have been like, it was like what Pat said, you know, I wouldn't have <laughs> attributed it to, to another, a book within a book. Um, but one of the, but I love that answer. And one of the reasons I love that answer so much is because like, I, I'll give you an example, even with me and my read of the book, like by you taking me back, to this time period. Um, and of course, there's all of the stuff that I expect to encounter, right? Like I expect to encounter queer bashing. I expect to encounter blackmail and raids and all this kind of stuff. But there was something that I didn't quite consciously expect, which was this idea of um, being dragged out of the closet and the trauma that's associated with that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I owe even I owe your book to a, a large degree of just bringing even my own experience with that to my attention through seeing it through this historical lens, because it's it's so easy, you know, it, there's, I guess, to explain a little bit, um, you know, there's coming out of the closet, there's living authentically, there's having the bravery and the courage and all these words that we use to um, take a leap and be yourself. And hopefully there's a safety net in front of you but there may not be, um, or you might have to work hard to find it. Um, but then the idea that these characters themselves, because of this world, they're desperately trying to stay in. Um, and, and again, I just totally never had dealt with my own experience and my own journey 
Um, uh, honestly, that aspect, I wrote over that whole thing. You know, I was sort of, I was sort of pulled out against my will in certain ways. You know, people, somebody finds something and somebody starts a rumor and somebody wants to, calls you in the middle of work and you're not prepared to address something, you know, or whatever. And so just to set to, to like really give you props for, for what you said just in your last answer and what you've done in the book, that was brought to my attention because you brought me in a world where that was the norm, so to speak, for those characters. So I think it's really um, sort of a powerful, a powerful thing that you've done there around that space. Thank you. <laughs> I have a question, gentlemen. Who do you think is the audience for this book? Uh, I mean, I think that anyone who likes a good mystery would be into this book personally. And I know we're talking a lot about, uh, you know, the queer history of it and all, but that history is history that straight people might want to know too. Like I, I, or at least I don't know why they would feel excluded from it. Certainly I don't feel excluded from learning about historical straight marriages. Um, so I think that the idea of, you know, learning about queer history is something that everyone needs, not just queer people. I think maybe you don't identify with it. It doesn't help you find yourself in the same way, but it helps you see other people and see, you know, our own history in a strong way. But I really did sort of think about, you know, my parents again, <laughs> who are uh, classic mystery readers and they are straight. And my dad, when he read um, uh, the, the advanced reading copy of this at one point, he was like, you know, I had to switch some things in my head because I, I just didn't think of it that way. So like, you know, the femme fatale becomes sort of an homme fatale, but it's just a good mystery, you know, and it's a good classical mystery. It's just that there's this twist. And so I think that that twist lets you explore so much more that, than it would have. It's almost like a, a you're going through a house you know and like that you're really familiar with and someone turns on a light you didn't know was there and it's the same house and you've always seen it in a light before but now it's lit differently and I think that's really exciting um, for any mystery reader. When I teach creative writing one thing I always tell my students is you want something to be familiar but fresh. You want it to be both and that is something I hope I accomplished here. So if you like a good, you know, PI historical mystery, then I think you'd still like this. Um, uh, Listen, I, I completely agree with you, but you know, just speaking <laughs> to myself, because I really did like this book, here are two of the things that I really found fascinating. I'm going to accept all the things that you have said. It was interesting for me to be reading something that is not my own experience. Now, the first thing is, that a really powerful mystery, you should mourn the victim. And mm -hmm. oftentimes in a failing in Agatha Christie is that the victim is just kind of a, you know, that excuse, uh, mm -hmm. whatever. So I'm really sad that I didn't get to know Irene because Irene is dead. Um, she's a really interesting character. And I found myself wishing that we had gotten to meet her before she fell over the balcony and created this whole question, you know, what she killed or was it suicide or whatever it is. So I think you did a great job because a, a mystery really does have to stand on, on three legs. You have to, you know, you have to empathize with the hero. You have to mourn the victim and you have to bring the bad actor to justice. So mm -hmm. I, I think you did all those things really well. In addition to taking us into a queer family and queer history and queer culture, which I thought was um, an excellent thing for me to read, we haven't talked about the soap industry. Come on. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that I really, really liked about this book was that, I mean, I travel a lot and I can tell you that you might be in like lower Quebec and five out of the 20 stores that you're going to go into are going to have handcrafted soap. I mean, they're going to be selling soap everywhere. And I found that the, the, back, the, the point of this is that Irene is this sort of soap whisperer. I mean, she is a genius in the same way that perfume people know how to blend perfume. Irene has this nose or, you know, whatever you want to call it, for soap. So her death is going to leave the family running the soap industry in jeopardy because who, in fact, is going to be able to do 
Irene's job. But in order to make that clear, you had to bring the soap industry to life. So, you know, I think it's important that, I mean, that's why I read the book for all those <laughs> reasons, you know, and, and I think that when you're presenting it, you, you need to talk about the classic mystery elements mm -hmm. as well as the queer culture and the, you know, the different way of, of looking at things. I like the way you said, you know, you lit the house differently. Um, but did you really? Because, you know, we could be reading a mystery set in Syria. And it would also be for the, mm -hmm. you know, for, for American reader anyway, that would be a different experience, right? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you. Those are all very, very kind words to say. And I'm, I'm, I still feel like I don't understand the soap industry at all. <laughs> Tell I us said, about the soap. soap industry. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Where does soap come from? Well, I, I, I will tell a good story about the soap uh, and the title, though, which is that um, I did not know it was going to be soap at first. I, oh, yeah? Yeah, no, I, um, I picked the title first, and I was going from that Agatha. Oh, that's my cat in the background. I was going for that Agatha Christie thing um, where, you know, Crooked House, essentially, except I wanted, I knew it was going to be based around a lavender marriage, which was when a gay man married a lesbian um, for appearances. And so I was like, oh, Lavender House. But that's when I was like, okay, but they can't really call it Lavender House unless they have another reason for it. So they must be growing flowers there. What are the flowers for? And I did briefly consider perfume instead, but so, especially in the 50s, that squeaky clean image like that, that to me felt more like a family that would have to hide their queerness. Um, so yeah, that's, I think it all, yeah, it all really comes together, but. It's an interesting point, but you know, let's face it, you have to have motive in all this, you know, mm -hmm. and motive generally comes down to money. It's something that somebody has that somebody else wants. And the, the engine for money in this book is the revenue from the soap company. And yeah. you know, so other people, you know, Irene is in control of the soap company. They're all living basically off the money that it, I mean, that's what's paying for Lavender House and the butler and the serve and the car mm -hmm. and the whole bit. So you did have to come up with some economic engine that would support the house and provide a motive. I mean, there are other motives. I mean, it could have been you know, jealousy. I mean, there, there's a variety of motives that you can have in a mystery, but money is the one that people understand. And it isn't just money. <laughs> it's access to things that money provides because money in itself means nothing. But what is money? what does money enable people to have to get to live? You know, if somebody has yeah. it, you want to take it away. I mean, yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. I it's it's funny. I knew they were rich, but I didn't know why <laughs> until I figured out the soap stuff. And so once that all fell into place, it felt like such a precarious empire. You know, I, it, does that make sense? It feels like uh, such a an interesting way to be making sure they have money, but also something that could go away easily. And part of that is Irene's nose and the fact that she's the one who is constantly remixing the formulas and making sure that people, uh, you know, are coming out for the new lavender every uh, year or something. But part of it is also just what what's the branding for soap? You know, there's just so much there where even a a whiff of scandal, and I'm not talking about queerness, but really anything could ruin a soap image because you think of those those ads. In fact, you know, I had one, <laughs> I had one done up. I have a bigger version. I love that. Oh, this is the the you know the fake uh, La Montaigne soap ad, um, uh, which I, I have like three left. If you pre-ordered it tonight from Poison Pen and you fill out a form on my website, I will mail you one of these. Um, but, you know, these sort of squeaky clean images of femininity, of, uh, you know, domesticity, that to me feels so precarious, not just for queer people, but for really anyone with a secret. 
Well, very true in the beauty industry. I mean, you could go back all the way back in soap to Lily Langtree and Pure Soap, for example, mm -hmm. when she became, you know, kind of a style icon and um, I was co-opted into Pure Soap. Um, so, you know, the cosmetic industry, I think, in general, if you want to include soap as a cosmetic thing more than a cleanliness thing, is always going to be precarious. It follows fashion, follows mm -hmm. influencers, you know, the brain can get tarnished. I mean, they're very modern. I never thought of it that way, influencers, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But, but, but as a result, Irene's death is a really precarious, puts everybody in a very precarious position. So mm -hmm. she was, you know, the soap whisperer, so to speak, with the nose and the whole bit. You up the stakes when, you know, one person, presumably only one, will find out. Well, I'm not going to tell you, you have to read the book to find out. <laughs> only one person is responsible for her death, but it's still that death puts a lot of people in jeopardy. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's a much more cataclysmic event in terms of the financial support that this whole thing has. So, oh, yeah. And yeah, there's, a lot, there's a lot of people really a lot of, money. <laughs> there's a lot in this book. There really is. There, there are many different ways to be reading it and to looking at it. And um, and I think I think um, you did a great job with it. I'm hoping, I heard you say magic words. You're writing a sequel? Oh, yeah. It's uh, The Bell in the Fog due out next fall. Oh, excellent. Well, I'm really glad to hear that. This is, you know, mystery readers do like, not all the time, but do like to invest in series. So if you read one book and you really like the characters, you know, you don't really want to give them up. Speaking of which, PJ, what's going on with you in Bathhouse? Because that was a huge success. What are you doing now? Yeah, I am. So I actually took a bit of a hiatus um, from writing. Bathhouse was um, an incredible experience. Um, and I uh, actually took space to deal with and confront a lot of the challenges and issues um, that Bathhouse deals with. It was a very cathartic therapeutic experience for me to be able to write um, about things I was dealing with and challenges not unlike Andy or Evander when it comes to alcoholism, when it comes to learning how to embrace um, you know, unconditional self-love to the best of your ability um, at the time. And, and so, I basically took the whole past year. Um, I've been sober since January 8th, um, which is uh, an incredible. Thank you. Yeah, an incredible thing. Um, it, a whole new lease on life in that way. Um, and I'm very lucky in that my publisher at Doubleday um, have been working with me very closely with my agent, with my film agent, and just basically being like, you know, he needs his space. Um, to, to, to giving me all the time and space I need, and I'm I'm happy to report um, that I actually signed a deal um, not all that long ago um, on my delayed uh, next book um, so that I could live long enough to have a next book because uh, to bring it back to queerness for a little bit, a lot of the stuff that goes into these works and, um, and certainly is, is uh, present in Evander um, and this character um, is, is also present in real life and, and affects, affects all of us so, so uh, deeply. Um, but I am uh, getting uh, doing a, a bit of a rewrite of my next book, Open Flame, which is a queer suspense about voyeurs and voyeurism mm -hmm. that I'll be turning in this spring. Um, and we'll see, we'll uh, take it from there. Um, but uh, to, to circle back a little bit, and thank you for that question, I appreciate it. Um, to circle back to the reason for the season while we're here, uh, Lavender House. Um, I, I can't agree more um, about just in terms of who the reader is for this book. The reader, I think, is someone who likes books, um, as someone who likes specifically, the, I mean, it's so wildly entertaining, like you've got the darkness, you've got um, the, just the voices, they're so, um, I mean, I don't know, I didn't live then, but like they seem so on point. Um, and just, you know, the fact that you chose soap, and I think of just very, I think of chemicals, I think of just soap operas, I think of these, these idealized versions and, and um, uh, heteronormative like gender roles and all that kind of stuff that sort of packed in with it. So I also think of, um, you know, even my own sort of challenges and you've got Andy steeped in um, when you open the book, right? In um, addiction, you are in you leaning on things for cr as crutches uh, to, to avoid what, you know, kind of lies below, so to speak. Um, he runs into a lot of false choices, an internal conflict with 
Um, you know, I work on the police force um, and I enjoy these bars and these places. And I feel like, you know, I've got guilt over not warning them, um, you know, about uh, potential raids coming up and like all that kind of stuff packed in. So I'm wondering like, what, like what, it, what was behind going there in a way, opening that book with that darkness, that nihilism in a way that felt so grounded, so real. Um, what brought you to that spot? What was that choice about? Um, well, you know, it's interesting. Yeah, it definitely opens with him sort of contemplating suicide and drinking a lot. <laughs> um, but to me, the thing, and obviously I think part of that is about him having just been kicked off the forest in, and, uh, you know, he's got no livelihood now um, because the police found him in a gay bar. They tell his landlord who kicks him out. Um, he has no prospects. Everyone, so he's been outed, as, as you said before. And that cuts off a lot of avenues for having a, a, the sort of life that he envisioned. And so he's not sure what a life would look like and is thinking about suicide. But to me, the opening is a little more is a little lighter than that because the first thing he does is he sees um, a teenager sort of yelling at his girlfriend in the back of the bar. He pulls him out, kicks him out of the bar and then proceeds to walk into the door. And like, to me, that sets up everything about him and where he is in life in that moment in that he is drunk, he is depressed. He is also like, has no idea where he's going. And then of course there's the literal sort of like all doors have been closed to him metaphor. Um, but a little a little on the nose there. But I, I think that there's something lighter about that scene so that even in that moment of darkness, we can see that there's a ridiculousness to it, if that makes sense. Um, and that's not to take away from his real, very real and justified, you know, uh, feelings. But it is a moment to be like, look, you know, you need, you have an opportunity now to sort of pull yourself out of that when this woman sits down next to him at a bar and is like, I have a crime for you, you know, classic noir setup. Um, and, but here's this guy who, who just walked into a door and I, I, I don't know, that moment, I, I didn't start with that originally. I added that scene on after, like, I just was having so much trouble with the opening. I'd written the whole book, but it just didn't feel right. And it wasn't until he walked into the door that he was like someone I could love in that moment, if that makes sense. Um, uh, and he wasn't, you know, I was no longer going down with him. I yeah. got to sort of take a step back and be like, this poor guy as opposed to, oh God, I feel real depressed now. Yeah. Um, and so that to me is just sort of a moment where we can, where you can balance that sort of noir humor with uh, the noir darkness. And I think that's what, what a good noir is all about too. It's about laughing in the darkness. It's about that sort of very cynical humor. Um, and so that to me is, where it all came from, if that answers your question. It, it does, and I felt, I mean, like, I the reason I kind of fell in love and was like, oh, I'm definitely like into this and gonna follow this character is because he was so self-aware. Like you say, like there's that self-awareness and that humor that comes with that self-awareness. Like he admits to himself before he socks this kid, he's like, I'm about to hit someone and I'm not going to feel any better about myself after I do it, you know? <laughs> but but what's implied there is like, yeah, he's, he's spiraling, but that there's hope, like there's that part of him, right? Mm -hmm. That knows that, you know, the implication that there, there's another way um, to sort of, to sort of choose. And so kind of on that same note, and I'm interested to hear what your take on this is, like, you know, I feel like the, the inclination and what the sort of candy wrapper is, um, is just viewing Lavender House through, for me, not being a well-read in, you know, hard-boiled detective, noir, that kind of stuff, but just this whole gothic feel to it. Like this whole manderly of darkness and shadow, but fun <laughs> because it's filled with queer people um, and one's mother. Um, and like, <laughs> it's just like, like, yeah, that's the sort of expected thing. But I'm wondering if you, what is, what is Lavender House more of 
to you, the author who created it? Is it more of a place to hide and a place of shadow? Or is it a house of healing, so to speak? Um, or is that a false, is that a trick question? I don't know. Like, what do you, what do you kind of think? When yeah, I mean, I don't think it's more of either. I think any house, any family found, biological, whatever, I think that it's a lot of things all at once. And, you know, yes, it can heal you if you let it. But yes, it can also destroy you if you let it. And it's about these people who are both. These people have been healed and they have been destroyed by it, you know? Um, and we watch Andy sort of go through that. And um, see, uh, we're trying to be spoiler free, but I will say he leaves the house at the end. I feel like that's not too big a spoiler. Um, but uh, especially since we, I've said there's a sequel. So <laughs> he leaves the house at the end. Um, and he gets out of it before it has a chance to destroy him. But also he sees that everyone who seemed sort of destroyed is immediately healing again after he leaves. Like there's this idea of, you know, what happens when any family, when, you know, someone's dead and maybe someone else killed them. Uh, you know, what what is that? What, how are you all going to react to it? And I think, you know, you, you look at any sort of, southern gothic even and people fall apart and then hopefully they get back together um and that is what i wanted to do with except with rebecca where the house burns down right so that gives you a whole different problem that killed right. in a different way it does you know guys we've gone over the hour so i really do need to pull patrick up here and see if there are any questions that anybody might have before we go too long well, Lev appears to have frozen anyway. He's in pregnant pause there. I wasn't sure if it was Lev or with me, but right. Lev, are you still there? No, I think he is frozen. Well, there you go. Right. So any questions that you want to raise? Well, let's see. Um, uh, one of the questions I was going to ask Lev was about, um, you know, he's so knowledgeable in film and and these old actors and actresses, and I was wondering who he might cast, you know, in some of those. Who, who would, well, PJ, who would be your casting choices for, uh, for Irene and Evander? Any oh, thoughts? Oh, gosh. Okay, I'll buy time until he clicks back on, um, because I did love all of the, the, like, the killer all about Eve quotes that were in there, like, um, I'm actually, I'd, I'd be curious whether he, like, falls on the um, Betty Davis or Joan Crawford side of that famous uh, uh, football field, so to speak, when, when he clicks back on. But yeah, I don't know. Like, I think, um, I feel like Sarah Paulson could play a role um, as either a Pearl or an Irene, someone who's, who brings that dark edge, but also um, Salt, like there's a sultriness to to uh, these characters as well that I think could come through. Um, I also could see like I could see like a Viola Davis as well as um, either one of those characters because I think she also embodies that sort of like very uh, in control like I've I've got this handled but there's also that sultriness like vibe that kind of comes through. Um, Evander, gosh. I don't know. What do y'all think while we're waiting? Um, who's Evander for, for y'all? You know, Barbara, what's, what do you at got? my age, I've lost track of who's anybody in Hollywood, so I can't. I'm talking about old classic, yeah, classic actors and actors. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, Joan Crawford, then, I would say, <laughs> for somebody. Here he is. For Irene. Let's see. Is he back? Hi. I don't know what happened there. there. My whole internet went out like for the whole house for a good few minutes. Which I know. Can... It does happen. It's not uncommon for this too. <laughs> We've just got a couple of minutes for questions, but the question was, do you have anybody in mind if there were to be a movie that would play Evander or Irene? Oh man. I mean even classic classic that... era Hollywood actors, not necessarily living ones today. Oh, that's a good way to go it. Yes, that's a good way to go it. That won't get me in trouble um 
for Pearl, I always pictured um, Dolores Del Rio, uh, hands down. Um, for Irene, who? I mean, there's definitely a Betty Davis vibe that you would see in sort of the back, you know, in the, the flashbacks. Um, let's see. For Andy, I mean, I it's sort of a, it, it is a Bogart vibe. There's no getting around it. There's a Bogart vibe. And that's what I was going for. So why run away from it? Um, that's what so, I agree Bogart. entirely. Patrick, anything else? Uh, let's see here. Um, well, Jill in, uh, in, I think that's how you pronounce her name in Australia. She was just saying, thanks. Uh, thank you for introducing a book that I would not have known about. Um, but now I really want to get a copy. Is it already published? Yes, it is. Um, is it published in Australia? Um, it'll be published tomorrow, so it'll be published in a few hours. <laughs> um, Probably. Macmillan is a, is a British company, and so I'm sure it'll publish in Australia. In Australia. Uh, it's technically not publishing in the UK and Australia yet, but you can probably get it through a lot of places anyway, because, sure. you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, Amazon that thing your way, because it is so good, and you will not regret it. And uh, yeah. I can't even, it, it's a tremendous, tremendous. We actually ship books to Australia every day, but I have to warn yeah. you that unfortunately the cost is prohibitive. So we generally say to our international customers, don't, one book costs the earth, but five books is just a little more. So if you come to our web, no, I'm serious. If you come to our website um, and you want to buy a book, you really should shop around because it doesn't make any sense to spend like $40 you know, to ship a book somewhere when for a few dollars more, you can get a whole bunch. We have a big international customer base. We ship overseas yeah. every day, but you know, the economics of it, we, we do need. I have to tell you, PJ, that shipping into Canada is almost as expensive as shipping into Australia oh, yeah. because Canada collects a excise tax. It is. I wonder though if Macmillan and I, they probably have an international version of the book. Even I'm if sure they do. haven't sold, that will be a little bit right. easy to get. Oh, but if you're in Australia, it. you got to get this book. I, I you know some people in Australia book. have bought it through an international shipper because I've sent some postcards to Australia. So there's yeah. definitely a way. <laughs> right. Well, people who buy from us are generally buying autograph books. They're paying for the signature. They're not really paying for the book. Oh, yeah. Um, well, it's sort of like collecting art prints. And many, many of those customers don't actually read in English. You know, they want to, they want the copy, but they are going to probably buy their own language version for ease of reading it. So, gentlemen, this has really been fascinating, but I think that we've run on quite a long way. Um, and it's been a real pleasure. I learned an awful lot this evening. Um, and um, I really recommend, you know, I'm a 82 year old straight woman who loved this book. So <laughs> I really, really do um, think that that nearly any mystery reader, well, yeah, any mystery reader would really enjoy the characters, enjoy the history um, and enjoy the writing, which we didn't mention, but, um, <laughs> but Lev is, is actually a wonderful stylist. And a great ear for dialogue. Like so. butter. You <laughs> hold off the tongue, like the words flow like butter. Swear to God, you'll love it. It's very it's true. All love it. So, before you freeze again, Lev, congratulations. Enjoy the rest of the week. And um, thank you so everybody. much. And thank you for having me. Thank you. It was and, a real pleasure. It seriously oh, was. No, Have a great yeah. week. Good night, everybody. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them and your help would be appreciated, please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.